How much is the book? Oh, I gotta get uh, eight three more. I'll be right back. Okay, yes. Is that on? I better? Okay. Yeah, it works if you hit the little green button. Or I guess the button's not green, but make the green light come on. So, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so let's, um, uh, let's think about some, some prayer requests. And, um, yeah, so a couple things. Uh, uh, Aubrey, you want to give us an update about Doug?
rose on the communion table Sunday, so that's good. All right, lots of things to keep in our hearts. Well, let's, um, let's pray together. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear gracious God, as we continue through this, this journey in Lent and trying to use this time to devote ourselves more closely to you, to work on being disciples that would follow you, to work on practices of prayer or kindness or whatever ways that will help us be reminded of this discipleship that we are on this journey for. None of us, none of us are going to perfect it, but we keep walking closer and closer to you. That is our hope. And even if we take the wrong steps, dear God, we pray that just the effort will be pleasing to you. We thank you, dear God, for this church family and for the way in which we look out for each other, pray for each other, take meals by, celebrate the great days and, and weep and cry on the difficult days. Remind us what a gift this is to have a community of brothers and sisters who are always there for us. Thank you for finding a way to inspire us and to nurture us to be your hands and feet to one another and help us to find ways in which we can be your hands and feet in this community. This night, we lift up a numerous people in our thoughts and prayers. We keep in mind Doug Mullis, Jane's niece, Leah, Cecilia Broom, Ken and Missy's family, neighbors, the Helms family. Ann Little. Kate Lavender. Jim Benfield. Vicki Flowers and Bill. We lift up prayers of praise for Donna Griffin and for the safe arrival of Arlo Hawkins and continue prayers for Sarah and for Tanner. Oh, gracious God, we know that all these things in our lives, from, from celebrations of birth and celebrating how procedures go through, from surgeries on rotator cuffs to, to even tubes in your ears, for how we live our lives in this community. When we read your stories, of how you work with the ancient people of Israel and how Jesus ministered to people, we know that our lives matter to you. We ask that you would help us to learn in following you that we would treat these lives all around us as sacred as well. For all that is continuing to happen in Ukraine, we just lift up our prayers for those people Help us to find ways in which we can also be helpful to their situation. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us when we fall short of following you. Forgive us by our sins of omission when we just stand by the sidelines and don't offer the help that we can. But more than forgive us, help us to reorder our lives so that we may follow you more closely when those times come around again. In this season of Lent, 
we give you thanks for forgiveness and claim the forgiveness you have for each of us so that we can live our lives not in regret and bitterness, but that we can live our lives free, not worrying about our sins, but learning to live as best we can as Jesus' followers. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. All right, um, so we're gonna start tonight with just an introduction and we'll, we'll have a couple weeks break. So um, uh, if you wanna get reading ahead on some of the chapters, let's give you a chance to do that. So, um, so if you um, wanna know kind of how Practicing Midrash kind of came about, um, I say a little bit about that in the preface of the book. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed um, after the book came out, uh, for about 15 months before COVID, I was able to speak and preach in um, several dozen churches across the Southeast. Uh, and it, it felt like it came full circle because uh, the inspiration for the book came out of a church ministry and it was uh, 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 my pleasure to be able to give that back to churches um, in, in, in their work. Um, let me also give a disclaimer. Um, this book is written for folks to have a deeper encounter with the Bible and to um, strengthen their uh, faith um, and to find better ways that they can walk closer to God. If this doesn't help you do that, it is okay to go in one ear and out the other. You will not hurt my feelings. So, um, so my prayer is that this will help your uh, walk with Christ, and if it doesn't, it's all right, let it go. So, um, uh, uh, again, inspiration I wanted to do this was for folks, a lot of folks who struggle with Scripture and have deep questions about it. Um, and that's really the audience I've been, been working with. Um, so the handout tonight um, is one I did a few years ago at a CBF of North Carolina uh, workshop um, when I was still working on the book. And um, it's just a kind of, it just ties in the two pages you have there, the front and back. It just lays out some of the high points in which there are multiple stories um, about events in the Bible. And when you kind of do all this together, as you get four, go ahead, Richard. Oh, you know what, they're all gone. No, they're all, this, everybody's stolen from you. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to share with somebody. Um, so, um, oh, Aubrey, Aubrey, and, Aubrey and Brenda have been good at sharing. How many years y'all shared together? Uh, <laughs> um, so really, I, I haven't gone through like to uh, get the data on it, but at least two-thirds to three-fourths of all the things in the Bible are told multiple times. Um, and we just don't think about that. Um, and uh, it, it just doesn't occur to us because most of the time we're just reading one story in the Bible at a time. Um, and it's not until you can begin comparing things, which is what we did at our church, we, were, we decided uh, that like a lot of churches, we felt like people didn't know the Bible well enough. And so let's try something different and try to work together and see if we can be more informed about the Bible. And so we decided we, we made a covenant and we were going to try to read through the Bible in one year. And a lot of y'all may have done that already. And so the deacons, uh, after I did some research, um, said, why don't you try to put together a devotional guide and we'll all do it together. And so using, I don't know, about a dozen other people in the church, we wrote a devotional guide, and the key was to break up the stories of the Bible so you could kind of read it as one continuous story. So rather than just going from Genesis all the way to the end of the Old Testament and with Matthew and the New Testament, we try to read it as one continuous story. So that meant shuffling the stories around. Um, and sometimes that just meant a couple of things, but sometimes, like, when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem and carted off the Israelites to exile, uh, we were dealing with Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel and Habakkuk um, and Zephaniah and uh, Second Kings and Second Chronicles and some of the Psalms and I'm sure something I've left out. Um, so, and what was what's fascinating is you had all these different viewpoints about one thing happening. Um, and so, as a lot of times, as you know, when you get all those different viewpoints in, you get different perspectives, different theologies. One of the things that we're going to run through um, as we kind of go through the several weeks of doing this, and I think we're going to end early in June, but we'll just see. Um, we may also have some church things that may take priority, so we have to push things around, but that's, that'll be all right. I don't think we're on a schedule, right? 
So if we go over a couple weeks to July, I think we're okay. Um, so what we'll find is um, there are really three big meta-narratives or meta-theologies in the Bible. Um, now, some theologians will, might say, well, you're smushing a lot of things together, and that's true. Um, and there's, within those big three, there's lots of different variations. But the big three, you already know them. Finish this sentence for me. God is love, right? Love. Everybody's saying things, right? That's, that's, that's scripture, right? God is love, right? That's one of them. Uh, there's another one. God is holy. I think I heard that. Holy. God is just is the third one. Those are the three big theologies. Um, and so, and they all have historical um, works with them. So the holiness theologians uh, came out of the priestly class in the Old Testament. So the books of Leviticus, uh, major portions of Exodus and Numbers, big parts of Genesis, um, all that. And they influenced all these writers behind them. And there's a whole slew of them that followed them. Uh, and they're all about holiness issues. And we'll talk more about what those things are. Um, and then Deuteronomy was a justice theologians. And they influenced a whole big group of theologians. So when you read Jeremiah, he is preaching Deuteronomy. It's just Deuteronomy switched to a preacher voice. Um, and so they're all about justice. And both the priests who are about holiness and the prophets who are about justice, they're all talking about sin, but they're talking about sin from different ways. Um, and so that's a whole fascinating thing. And then you have these people who they want to talk about sin, but they want to talk about God's love. And God's love is greater than sin. And those stories are all over the place in the Old Testament. And what's fascinating is these big three, these three big theologies carry over in the New Testament. And it's just fascinating to see. And um, I didn't realize, I mean, I knew some of this stuff from seminary, but it wasn't until we did this study and had all these stories broken up so we could find out, follow the chronological story of the, of the Bible, and we kept seeing the same contrast and the same tension over and over again. And I said, well, I gotta, I gotta work on this. Um, and this was the end result of that. So I, I think it's fascinating, this three, this three is fascinating. Um, Y'all remember when you're in kindergarten and you got the paint, finger paint, and you found out the primary colors, right? And what are the primary colors? Blue, yellow, and red, right. And if you get your fingers in there, you can make all the other colors of those three, right? If you have an inkjet at home, right, your inkjet has three colors, right? Only they don't call them red, yellow, and blue, right? It's magenta and something and something. Yeah, I don't know what it is, right? What would you say, Richard? Well, man, you, if you know all those three, I'm, you're going up on my list to know that stuff, man. <laughs> and, and here's what's fascinating. With those three colors, however you do them up, we get the whole color wheel, right? The whole color wheel. Um, most of us sit in chairs like these over here that have four legs, uh, but a four-legged chair is not the most stable chair, is it? What's the most stable chair? Stool, three, exactly right. Three is the most stable, right? Um, you can't, once you get three, there's not going to be any rocking because they're going to land together. The Trinity, we think of God as the Trinity, right? So it's interesting to me that they have these three great narratives, each with statements that we say about God. God is love. God is holy, God is just. And these three, like the three legs of a stool, are stable. But they're also in tension with each other. The reason the stool is stable is because they are t in tension with each other. And these ideas are in tension with each other at all times. They're pushing and pulling, right? Uh, every child uh, who tests mom and dad out, they, they know about this tension, right? Because uh, probably you have one parent that's a softy and one parent that's a toughy, and you figure out pretty early in life which is which, right? And that's, in, that's intention. Mom and dad love is intention with that. Um, and so, and then the grandparents come in, that's the third stool, third leg of the stool. So um, these are intention. And so um, 
so all these images for me help me to see the wisdom of God in Scripture like this. That has all these multiple stories about events and thinking about things. Um, these multiple stories, I think, are part of God's genius to creating the three-legged stool, the three primary colors that make all the theologies that we have. Um, so I think that, that there is purpose, that there is divine purpose in these multiple stories. For me, what's sad is I don't think the church has helped us to read these duplications and these disagreements uh, and these arguments, as I would say. The church largely has been afraid of that and thinks that somehow if things disagree, that it somehow means the Bible's not true or accurate. But even if you all don't know that, I'm suspecting that deep in your hearts, you know this is true. Um, I've forgotten some of the things. I know uh, we've had some teachers. Do we have any teachers, former teachers in here tonight? I know I've met a bunch of teachers here. We've got a bunch of teachers in the church. But, so, Reeves. So, but you all have, everyone's been in school, right? So let's pretend we are in, let's say, um, eighth grade English class, okay? And um, let's see. So Jane is the smart student, all right? And somehow her brother is in class with her. So, you know, they're twins this year, so right now. And, and, but Kevin's not such a great student, but he's smart enough to sit close to his sister, all right? And right behind is Julia, and she's there looking. And so the teacher knows, and Julia makes pretty good grades, but not like Jane, all right? And the teacher does this English test, a written essay test, and at the end of the test, she is amazed. Jane gets an A. Julie gets an A, I think that's pretty good. Kevin gets an A, that's the surprise. Um, and when the teacher's reading it, she realizes, well, Kevin said the same thing Jane did. And Julia said the same thing Jane did. Now, does this teacher say in her mind, in her thoughts, hmm, I must be the smartest teacher in the world because all my students are great. Is that what she's thinking or is she thinking something else? And what is she thinking? They cheated, right? Right? So, <laughs> so because when you got three people writing answers to an essay exam, even if they are all pretty close together, you expect what? Some differences, right? Because people see things in different ways. If they all say the same thing, you know something's fishy. All right? Let's think of another scenario. So um, let's say that um, uh, you, um, you're walking down uh, Main Street. You come out of downtown, and you're walking up here to the church, and um, you see uh, three people, um, run, or a couple people running out of the bank real fast. And so you call, and you hear alarms going off, and you call the cops, and they rush there, and uh, they take your message, and they take... Uh, the witness of three other people about this bank robbery. And um, you didn't just saw at the end. The other people said they saw everything. And when they begin telling the police officer what they saw, lo and behold, they all saw the exact same thing. They even said the license plate on the car that got away is the same. Now, does this police officer say, hey, this is going to be the easiest case in the world. I'll solve this right away. Or does the police officer say what? Something is fishy, right? Because no three witnesses are going to see the exact same thing the same way, are they? Even if they all got a good view of that license plate, they probably can't even remember it exactly the same way, right? Think something fishy. We actually think there's more truth if we see, if we hear different descriptions, and then we can kind of work on those different descriptions to figure out what the clue is, right? We know this is true, yeah. All right, I don't, this, this may get a little personal. So, um, so imagine in your family, you might have a different number in your family, but imagine you had three different children, three kids in your household, and uh, you're gonna just leave them for a little bit. They're, the oldest is old enough to, to be okay with the younger ones for a short bit, and you just run off for a quick errand, and you're back in, you know, 30 minutes. But when you get back, the lamp in the living room is broken on the floor. 
and you're a smart parent, so you talk to each of them separately, right? And what you find out is that it was Sparky, the dog, that knocked over the lamp, and that's what happened. And all three of those children saw the thing exactly the same way. And do you think, well, I just think I have to punish Sparky about that, or are you thinking something else? <laughs> What'd you say, Jim? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Get, get check that camera. So, yeah. So you guys get it, right? We all know this, right? Except somehow we bought the line that the Bible's when they the Bible tells three stories, two stories, they're supposed to be exactly the same. But we know that's not how truth works out, right? So as we're reading in these weeks ahead these different stories, I want you to keep that in mind. And in fact, biblical scholars uh, believe. They're, they're the ones always like breaking it down. Well, did this really happen or did this not happen? You know, they want to do all that kind of stuff. One of their signs about the likelihood this story was true is when there are different descriptions that disagree because of the very thing we're talking about. So we're going to be on a journey that may be different than how you've done Bible study before because we're going to see these different stories and we're going to talk about them. And, but all of that is in understanding that this is how God inspired the Bible and that God had a purpose to that. And I hope by the end, that's one of the things we're going to talk about because this, all this brings two great questions. When you look at this list, the first great question is, you know, what is God about? Why is it like this way? What is God up to? And then the other question is, why hasn't the church helped us to learn to read the Bible this way, to work this out? So um, at the end of this thing, the last session is going to be a lot about what do you think Think about the mind of God. What is God up to in inspiring a Bible like this? Um, and then if we want to complain about the church, we can do that. But that's in the past. We won't do that too much. So, All right, let's, um, let's see. What's I going to talk about next a little bit? Um, so I, wanted to, I, I called the, the book um, Practicing Midrash. Are, are you all familiar with that term? Who, who has heard of the term midrash before? And it's not a rash in your stomach. Okay, so that, this is a new word. Okay, so... Um, so midrash is a Jewish term, which makes sense. Our, our faith came from a Jewish tradition. Um, and uh, I'll talk about it in the introduction just a little bit. And it, uh, it comes out of the word um, which means to investigate. And if you've ever you know, seen some kind of stereotypical ways of kind of Jewish Bible study or whatever, in, in the past it was, particularly in the Middle Ages, was really... Um, Argumentative. It was the point was to work on these different discussions, and the rabbis um, after uh, after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans um, in 70 A.D. and Christianity began its work. The rabbis uh, worked at trying to figure out how do we how do we become this faith without a temple, which is the second time the Jewish faith had to ask that. Um, and it was really on trying to go back to become a people of the book. And the rabbis began working on trying to write down all of their disagreements and arguments. Um, so they were questioned about where, where are the gaps in Scripture and where does Scripture disagree? And let's figure out what the answers would be. And so the point was to write down all of these arguments that the rabbis had and to save them so future generations could continue the conversation. But they never imagined the conversation would ever stop. In other words, nobody ever wins the argument. Somebody might feel today this scripture answers our question better than that scripture. But next week or a year from now or a generation from now, it might be the opposite. Because times change, right? Situations change. We know that just reading our own country's history, you know. You can know that from your own life. Um, what I've found, you probably found this as well in your life, some scriptures that meant a lot to me when I was uh, a young adult are not as important to me now. And other scriptures that didn't seem too important to me that 30 years ago are very important to me now. My life's different, different phase of life. So the Bible speaks to me in different ways. So I think you know, all of this kind of this idea of midrash that lets scripture 
argue with itself and listen to the arguments and see where and how is God speaking to you today. That's the key. There's not a one answer forever. There's an answer for today. And maybe it's the same answer tomorrow and the day after that and Wednesday, but at some point it's going to change because you're going to change or the surroundings are going to change or your family's going to change or your job changes. Something's going to change. So this idea of midrash is deeply embedded in the Jewish faith, and I really think we Christians should learn from that. Um, they were people of the book longer than we were. I think we learned from that wisdom. Um, what I did was to try to think about, is there a Christian tradition that would kind of help us to do this? And this was kind of, I kind of went on a limb with this, so if this doesn't work for you, that's fine. Um, but there is... Um, there is a, a prayer from, from a 16th century uh, mystic named St. John of the Cross, a threefold prayer. All this is an introduction chapter. And the, the first movement was via purgativa, or to purge, or to let go. Um, so, the, so in each of my chapters, as we kind of think about these texts that are different, the first, the first step is to kind of let go of the way that you've been taught about things. Let go, of, sometimes we just try to fix scripture, right? I know in two weeks, when we talk about the two creation stories, we're gonna try to fix it because we really want there to be one creation story and it keeps on going. But to do that, we have to change the scripture. And what I'm saying is, let scripture be as it is and wherever we're uncomfortable about things, just, just live through the discomfort. And don't try to fix it. Just let it be. Let the differences speak to you. Let, it, let, let go trying to fix things. The second stage was via illuminativa or to illuminate. So um, can we sit and listen? What is, how is God speaking to us through these different scriptures that seem to be seeing the same thing through different ways? Um, and one of those ways may speak to us strongly, another way may not, or both of them may in different ways. So can we listen, what is the voice of God right now as we listen to these different things? So each week we'll be talking about how these different stories provide different theological perspectives on this event. So in two weeks when we talk about the two creation stories, what's the theological message of story number one? What's the theological message of story number two? And then we think about, well, which one speaks to us right now? And some of us may really feel like chapter one speaks to us. Others may feel like chapter two, three does, speaks to us. Some may feel like I'm holding on to them both. <laughs> um, but that's because all of us are in different places. So you'll, once we kind of get into a couple chapters of this, you'll get into that. Um, then the final thing is via unitiva, which means union. And here we're seeking to be united with God's word. What does God have for us to take away from this discussion, this conversation between these uh, dueling texts? So we, we listen for the message of God in both these texts, but as we leave, what do we take from this? Um, so I try to, if we can move away from the perspective of what's the right answer to what is helping me live my faith deeper, that's a different question. Um, we Baptists are into getting the answers. Um, I got a great story, but I'm not, I won't say it now. Um, Scott, you may have put the time up there for me at some point, so because I'm not, I don't have a manuscript this time. Don't want to go too long, but. Um, yeah, sometime I'll tell that story to y'all. I've told, I've told Tori and the staff, and they loved it, so um, I'll tell you all sometime. Um, okay, before we move on, does anybody have any questions so far, or did anybody have any questions from the, reading the introduction that I want to make sure I answer for you tonight? Um, any questions on the introduction or questions so far? All right. So let's see if we can have some fun here. Um, yeah, okay, 636, we're doing well. Um, so let's see if we have some fun here. Um, so, all right, who killed Goliath? David. David, are you sure? 
Don't anybody Google it yet. Okay, don't, go, don't get your phones and David and Goliath and start Googling it. All right, all right. Okay, let's go to David. Let's go to the story that we all know well, that we were taught in, in Sunday school and that your Sunday school teacher had to, had, to, had to swipe all the slingshots from the boys and maybe some of the girls after that if they taught that inspiring story. Um, <laughs> one year we were at West and um, one of the, at one of the national parks, I forget which one it was, and they had a slingshot and we were thinking like, why would they do this? But sure enough, our son said, I want to get that. That's the present I want to get. <laughs> so I don't think he broke anything, but we were really worried about that. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's find 1 Samuel chapter 17 in your Bibles. And make sure you get 1 Samuel, not 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17, and we're just going to read the first 11 verses to kind of get things rolling here. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokah, which, meet, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokah and Azekiah. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the other side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin bronze slung between his shoulders. And verse 7 is a key verse. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. This is all because he couldn't carry all that stuff. Nobody could. He stood and shouted to the ranks of the Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So this is a story we remember, right? So keep looking at verse 7. Hold on to that. when you. Uh, we're going to move in a minute, but make sure you stick your finger in that verse. Um, so let's just double check if we remember his sake and go to verse 48. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. And there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew out its drew it out from its sheath and killed him, and then he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Well, that should answer the question, right? Except now I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. Find the right verse here. I didn't mark it right. Well, I thought it was verse 9, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm sorry? 19, thank you. Yep, there we go. I wrote it down wrong. Okay. So let's go to um, verse 18. After this battle took place with the Philistines, notice the Philistines are battling again, at Gob, then 
Sibachai the Hushanite killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. Remember, Goliath was a giant. Then there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob, and El Hananan, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. That's the same verse that was in 1 Samuel 17, 7. According to this story, El-Hananan is the one who killed Goliath. Now how about that? Isn't that interesting? And we're going to get to that in a second. And, and we're going to find out that in a second. And that came from another story. That's right. Hebrew does not have that. The original version has it just as we just read it. So, what's going on here? Well, somebody else read this story and said, wait a second. I could have sworn David was the one who killed Goliath. Now, what are we going to do about that? Now, it's not one of our most uh, favorite devotional books, but the books of First and Second Chronicles rewrote the books of First and Second Kings. Now, this is not uh, that unusual. This happens elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, the Gospel of Mark was the first gospel, and Matthew and Luke took almost most of Mark and made that a part of their Gospels and they rewrote that, okay? Uh, they changed things for lots of reasons. Sometimes they thought Mark made a mistake. Sometimes uh, maybe they heard a different story. It's hard to know that. Maybe sometimes they just changed things because the theology was different. We'll be talking about that later. But we know that in the New Testament this happened. It also happened in the Old Testament. There are other places in the Old Testament where we see passages being rewritten and copied. So um, part of the ending to 2 Kings is also in the middle of Isaiah. They're copied, and pretty much some of the words are copied word for word, and then other places things change. So what's interesting about Chronicles is that Chronicles decided they didn't, they didn't rewrite all of First and Second Kings, um, and, and they also wrote part of 2 Samuel, um, they only began with the coronation of King David. So the stuff in 1 and 2 Samuel um, that was before David's coronation, the chronicler, the person who wrote 1 and 2 Chronicles, just left that out, didn't worry about that. Said, I'm gonna start this story about when King David was coronated and then I'm going to do the history of Israel all the way uh, to, uh, to Babylon. So um, it was a story about Israel's kings. So this story about David killing Goliath wasn't a part of Chronicles. Because it didn't begin until David was coronated as king. And his battle with Goliath happened when he was still a teenager. So that wasn't a part of Chronicles. But Chronicles knew the story. And when Chronicles came up to this uh, verse in 2 Samuel 21, he did the same thing you guys are doing. Wait a second. Elhanan didn't kill Goliath. David killed Goliath, right? So let's go see what the chronicler did in the story. So 1 Chronicles chapter 20 Verse 5. Let's hope this time I copied it down right. And Chronicles is just after Kings. So 1 Chronicles chapter 20. All right, so... Let's go again. Verse 4. We'll start with verse 4. 
After this, war broke out with the Philistines at Gezer. So it's still the Philistines. They've changed the name of the location. Um, this happens also a lot. Uh, if you notice, this happens in U.S. history, too. If you read Civil War accounts, uh, oftentimes uh, the Union and the Confederates had different names for the places where the battles took place. So this is not unusual when you have different storytellers telling things. Um, so, uh, war broke out with the Philistines at Gezer and Sibachai, the Hushanite, killed Sippai, who was one of the descendants of the giants, and the Philistines were subdued. Again, there was a war with the Philistines, and El Hanan killed Lammi, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose shaft, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There's that same verse in there together. So that same verse has been copied now three times. So uh, as the identifying piece, this, this verse, maybe this is the verse that really was carried on. You remember all these stories were carried on as oral histories before they were written down, right? So maybe it was that, the, that, that was the key thing everybody remembered, the shaft of, of whose was like the weaver's beam. Um, so that's the, that's the centerpiece in all these stories. So either David killed Goliath or Elhanan killed Goliath or Elhanan killed Goliath's brother, Lammy. Two of those things can be correct, but not all three. So, interesting, right? All right, what do you think? Um, is the chronicler like you? He's like thinking, wait a second, David's the one who killed Goliath, not this other guy. I don't even remember this guy's name, you know? Did he change the account? Is he the one that changed things? Or, think about this. What's another famous story about David? What's another story about David, famous story about David? What'd you say, Bill? You can speak louder. My... Give me another famous David story. You all know your saints. Did you say Bathsheba? Yeah, Peggy said Bathsheba. Yeah, there's, there, there, there's, there's one. David and Bathsheba, right? And the story about David and Bathsheba is the all-powerful king steals another man's wife and kills him over her, right? So, a man, let me come back to this. Let's look at one other thing, one of the details. Fascinating. Um, back to, does it say it in Chronicles? No. Back in chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, when it describes Elhanan, it says that he was a Bethlehemite. So he was from the town of Bethlehem. Where was David from? All right. Where does Jesus go to be born according to Luke's story? Bethlehem, Bethlehem right? Because he was from the lineage of David. David was a Bethlehemite. This is even better, right? Because now both of these people who may have killed Goliath were from Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is not like Charlotte. It doesn't have gobs and gobs of people. It's more like Mount Holly, right? You, you can know people, right? Isn't that interesting? That the discussion, the argument between who killed Goliath were both from Bethlehem. Yeah, that gets a little better, right? So, we also know David has this story about Bathsheba where he steals another man's wife and kills him over her. So, let me ask you this. Would a man who does that, would he steal another man's great story and honor and take it for himself? What did you say, Lanny? You betcha. You betcha. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's just, if Elhanan had been, I don't know, if he'd been from, you know, uh, Klingon or what, some other place, uh, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have, the, 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 the thoughts wouldn't be coming my way, right? Or maybe not to yours. But the fact that he was in the same little town, smaller than Mount Holly, 
makes me think, hmm, David was a thief. Maybe he stole this guy's story just like he stole Uriah's wife. <laughs> you better keep your eyes open, right? That's right. Maybe. <laughs> so we can't answer this question, of course, right? There's no way to know that. But I just think it's fascinating. And I think it's fascinating that the, the person who wrote Chronicles knew that one day people like us would be having this discussion. And so he decided, well, I gotta, I gotta fix David, I gotta save David here, you know? And in fact, that's what the chronicler does, his whole theology. We'll talk about his story a little bit. And the chronicler cleans up all the messes of King David and all the messes of King Solomon. You're gonna find out all the sins that either one of them had, they just disappear in Chronicles. <laughs> just disappear. We're going, we'll talk about the theology with that. So he saves David's story, even though th David killing Goliath was not one of the stories that he wrote about. But he knew one day people like us would be having this story. So he made sure there was a different version of the story. And that was that, oh, Elhanan, he killed Goliath's brother. And now it's left to us to decide what do we think happened to the story. So, I say all this story to help you think, what is God doing here? How is it that God is inspiring these different stories about this not such a huge thing, you know, one tiny story in the Bible, bragging rights, who killed this giant? All right, what's going through your minds? And it's okay to say, Tim, I think you're just nuts. What are you doing to us? What's going through your mind? He may have been that way. Maybe he did it to try to get people to keep their keep their distance away from him on purpose. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jane. And when we get to that story about David and Goliath, we're going to compare the Samuel version and the Chronicles version and talk about that very thing. What you also Exactly. You know, and yes, there's places and certain things missing in the Bible, but you'll find it over here and you come back to it as you read, you're like, oh, why is it over here? Or, yeah, this version's over here, but this version is, is different. So you, you just have to remember different people with different things yeah, in the yeah. Bible, sometimes at different times. Exactly. And and, and Chronicles and Saint uh, Chronicles and Samuel were several hundred years apart. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. In terms of the first two stories, we don't know. Um, but Chronicles' version came a few hundred years later. Yeah. Lanny? But this is God inspired. Yeah. This is every word in this Bible is true. Now, where did the corruption start? Or what happened? Well, I'm hoping if I keep sharing this, you'll help give me an answer, Lanny. I got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I got what it is. Right. That, that's the, the one in 2 Samuel 21, 19, okay. which says El, Elhanan. Well, that was added in there because, uh, look, at the, look at the footnote, look at the footnote. Right, the footnote adds that in. The New Revised Standard doesn't do it. Um, and so, and they add it in because in Chronicles, they put that in there. So does not have his brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah, that's, that's another way to kind of go with story. Either way, Goliath was killed, the Philistines went away, Israelites came. So maybe the point for us to get to is, it's not really that important who did it, right? Yeah. So part of this is trying to figure out when these texts disagree, what's the important thing? What's the piece we take out of this? Yeah, Carson? It goes back to what you said earlier about us being good Baptists. We're trying to find the right answer. 
Uh huh. But I think the question we're posing is, well, how is God using these contradictory stories in some way? Right. How is God using these for us? Right. Right. Is, is I think what you're trying to. Yeah. Say exactly. Question. Exactly. Knowing that we yep. have faith in that the words in the Bible are inspired. Right. But that it helps us then deal with the contradictions that we're constantly facing. It, exactly. And, I, and, it, and so the reason I picked this small example tonight for us to see is for us that it's okay to question these stories and to work on what does it mean and that we can't always fix them. We can't always figure it out. With these three stories, you can't... Like I said, two of them can be factually correct, but not all three of them. But being factually correct, most of the time, is not the important thing. To go back to Julia's point, it's not, factually correct is not most of the time the important thing. The important thing is what do I take out of this? How does this story help me get closer to God? And so it, it, it tries to push us, I'm trying to push us beyond that piece of it, to seeing when these contradictions are here, what's what am I working through? What am I working on? Right. Yeah. So, and, and the living word is exactly what I think this way, the way God inspired about with all these different stories, that it that's what makes the Bible a living word. These conversations continue and continue. And so it's okay for us to have these three stories about killing Goliath and never solving the problem. And so the rest of this sentence, we're not going to solve an answer, but we're going to try to talk about a conversation in which each of us kind of work through things and figure out how may God be speaking to me about this. And sometimes it is about how does God speak to us as a church too as well. All right. In the last thoughts, we've got last. Yeah, Jay. Right. Yep. And they had, and they had many battles with the Philistines. Yep. Yeah. Good thinking, Jay. What else? All right. Well, I hope you're all ready for a, a fun excursion. I think this will be fun. So next week, no Bible study uh, because we will be having Monday Thursday services on, and Good Friday services. Both those services will be at 730. Um, on Tuesday, we'll have Stations of the Cross uh, here in the sanctuary. It's just drop in your own time of prayer and reflection um, and meditation. Stay here for 15 minutes. Stay here for two hours. That's your thing. Uh, we'll have a little booklet for you to go through. I'll say some more Sunday. Uh, but, yeah. Thanks for tonight. We'll see you next week. See you Sunday. <laughs>